This live stream is brought to you by the Water Corporation. Western Australia has its own unique climate and with that comes its own set of challenges, particularly when it comes to creating a beautiful garden. Water Corporation has a wealth of resources to help master your garden, including a WaterWise plant directory, irrigation tips and popular garden designs. To find out more, visit watercorporation.com.au forward slash WaterWise. Hello, good morning. Welcome to Gardening the WA Way. It's an edition of the Garden Gurus Live brought to you by the Water Corporation. It's a beautiful Sunday morning here in WA. I'm just looking outside and I just wish I was in the garden. Guys, for the next 90 minutes, we have got a fantastic program. It's an opportunity for you to learn a lot about well, water-wise gardening right here in WA, but at the same time, a chance for you to ask your garden questions too. So we're going to encourage you to do that as much as you possibly can. We've got lots of prizes for you. There's three fabulous $25 vouchers to spend at Guildford Town Nursery at the Garden Centre down there, which is just sensational, by the way. If you haven't been, it's a great, great opportunity for you to go and spend some money. And you'll have a chance to meet Joanne Harris, who is probably one of our industry's, well, most knowledgeable people and certainly runs one of the most awarded garden centres in Australia. So Joe will join us in the studio here a bit later on. We've got packets of seeds that will be going out to people who are asking questions. So please do that. And speaking of prizes i've got some more we've got some great little books so we'll award uh, these to the best questions so there is the west australian garden guide that nev passmore and i wrote some years ago now um this is a great little book i don't know if you've seen this before it's two dogs and a garden it's about uh two beautiful dogs that live in this gorgeous garden in new south wales we've got delish which is all about growing your food and all throughout this it's the way to do it in a water wise way and the rose one of the most beautiful plants with all the new varieties and of course the great thing about uh, about that book is that it's written by Nep Passmore myself a number of eminent um, rose experts from across the country indeed from all over the world now, um, the good thing about it is that we've made sure that we've written it in such a way that it addresses the most important thing, and that is how to grow roses successfully here in WA without using too much water. Now, as things are warming up, and we've got ourselves a pretty interesting day, we've had uh, a 30 degree day this week, which has been um, pretty amazing to, to get that sort of heat this time of the year along with rain, along with cool weather, cool nights, and it really changes the way the garden performs. This week, we've got about 45 mils of rain predicted throughout the week. We've got some warm days. We've got some cold days. This is a great time of the year to be out in the garden, to be planting and doing some pretty exciting things. So we'll share those tips with you as we go. Um, we've got Terry Selleck joining us from the Turf Growers Association of WA. He'll talk about uh, watering um, your garden on these what we call fringe months. These are the months that you don't need to turn your sprinklers on necessarily, but Terry will tell us all about that. Uh, as far as technology goes, there's a lot of pretty interesting watering technology and we've got uh, Merrick joining us from Waterwise Landscaping. He's going to share some of his top tips. Mentioned Joanne before. Joanne will be joining us a bit later on in the show. You'll be able to ask Jo some questions uh, as well. She is an absolute gun. Nobody knows gardening quite as well as Jo. Shall we get into some questions? Maybe just before we do, I just want to emphasise it's really important you tell us where you're from within WA. We've got five climatic zones here. So it's really important that you do actually let us know where you are from and uh, even your suburbs. It does make a big difference with regards to um, exactly where you are, north of the river, south of the river, if you're in the hills, uh, the different types of soils. All of these things do make a big difference to the advice that we'll provide Let's get kicking off right in the heart of, uh, of our great sta state, the, the capital, Perth. Melissa has written in, I've been advised that I should rip out my passion fruit and replace it as this one isn't growing well. It's in a pot for a year and then transplanted six months ago into this position. It receives the majority of sun in my garden and is watered well. What's the thoughts? Okay, well, generally passion fruit, um, if they're going to perform, you'll find that they start to take off and start to grow pretty well within the first six months. Once you start chopping and changing and damaging the roots, it can set them back quite quite badly. And it also depends on what you've got, whether it's a seedling passion fruit or whether it is a grafted passion fruit. So 
if you've got an unhealthy grafted passion fruit, more often than not, you'll find that the rootstock will sucker up and you won't really get a good plant. My suggestion is that you probably look at putting in a fresh plant. I think if it's not performing and it's unhappy, um, and probably there's a possibility it might have been a little bit root bound as well, that it's probably not going to take off. If it's sitting there and it's looking really unhappy this time of the year, um, it could be affected by cold, but more likely it is just an unhappy plant. So maybe take a look at getting one of those beautiful new varieties that are out there. Maybe we'll ask Joe about that a bit later on. Carol is in Riverton. Um, I was given a native plant that was pulled out of the ground. Now I'd like to know the best way to replant them and will they survive? Well, as a general rule, natives don't transplant super well. So it depends on how it was taken out of the ground, whether it's got soil around it. Um, one of the tricks with transplanting plants is to try and offset the shock of transplant by giving them a bit of a soak in sea sol. Um, it's a seaweed extract. And um, within it, what it does is effectively it's full of plant hormones. And any damaged roots, it tends to seal those roots off and encourage new feeder roots, those little fine white roots to start to take off and grow. Um, if ever there was going to be a time to tr successfully transplant natives, it's probably right now. So maybe uh, maybe give it a go, give them a bit of a soak in sea salt, get them into the ground, make sure it's nice and moist, so water it. Uh, but don't go, you don't necessarily need to be putting them into um, into a potting mix as such in this particular instance. Uh, one, of my, one of my great friends is uh, a, a, an expert based up at Kings Park. Uh, he always talks about the importance of actually them growing in the natural soil that they're in. So as long as they're natives that have originated from this region, um, then then do that. If they're natives that have originated from other parts of Australia, and this is the problem with the word native, um, they may well need a, a better soil. But look, I wouldn't be overly optimistic, but now's the time to, to do it. If you're ever going to have a shot, now's the shot. Now's the time to have a shot. Now we've got Julie. Julie's in Perth. Uh, what can I... What can I use to fertilise my tree fern that's not looking happy? Well, a tree fern should be looking happy at the moment. And sort of certainly fertilising is a, is a good thing to do this time of the year because as things warm up, the ground warms up, the environment's better, there's more sunlight, they should be growing away. So a controlled release fertiliser is probably the thing I would suggest. It's always the safest way to go. You don't want to put too much on. And maybe just a little liquid feed with something like fish emulsion. That is always a good thing with ferns. They love that. That high P is really good for them. Leah is in serpentine. Uh, can I plant cucumbers now? Well, I've just uh, planted seeds last week, actually, of cucumbers in my garden. Um, it needs to be in a warm spot. They do like it warm, um, but now's the time to get seeds into the ground. So, yes, you can, Leah. Hope that helps. Uh, Rebecca is in Hilbert. I've pulled out my front lawn and planted natives. Good on you. It's looking amazing, but uh, what with and how often should I feed it? Well, look, it depends on, again, that terminology natives. If we're talking about plants that are endemic to the Perth region, makes a big difference to maybe some of the East Coast natives. Some of those grevilleas, for example, those beautiful big flowering grevilleas, are what we call tropical grevilleas, and it's because they grow in a place where there's a lot of rainfall in summer, and their expectation will be that they have the same amount of water applied during the summer here. So if you're going to look for grevilleas, look for local varieties if you can. My suggestion would be, as far as fertiliser goes, again, to stay with a controlled release, but look for one that's specifically for native plants, okay? It's really important. They tend to have lower P and K in, in their mix, as a general comment. Um, and, and not too much nitrogen. So it's more about slow, steady feeding and encouraging them to feed on a regular basis. So to make sure that the soil's not um, barren one minute and then full of nutrients the next and, and causing a burnout of the root system. King is a good friend of ours um, who's in Perth here and uh, he has got a native fuchsia. Okay, it's in a pot and you can see there's a photograph there. There, there we go, it's up on the screen. Um, it's finished flowering and I've not pruned the plant since I bought it. It was a tube seedling a few years ago. When do I prune and repot it? Well, as soon as it's finished flowering is the time to prune it. And it does look a bit hungry to me. You can see there's some reddish kind of leaves there. That's usually an indication. Um, in fact, the way the leaves are sitting on the plant, usually an indication that um, it does need to be fed. So again, um, sticking to that theme, and this is the time of the year, use a controlled release plant food. Now there's two benefits of those. And the one I mentioned before about regular feeding, small amounts every day, 
very important. The second bit about it is that with a controlled release plant food, you don't necessarily have to water it in straight away. When you're using those very fast release plant foods, you actually have to wash them into the soil. You need to make sure that they're washed in and that, um, that you've basically got them moving through the soil and soluble as quickly as possible. Otherwise, there's potential for you to burn. So controlled release plant food, there's lots of good ones. Troforte is a good example of a local brand. Um, Osmocote was the world's leading brand. Um, there's, there's a few of them out there now. So keep your eye out when you pop into your local Waterwise garden center. Okay, now I think I'm gonna get Makata to scroll down a little bit for me. Daniel is in Perth. Um, Daniel, let's have a look. Hedge of lily pillies. And again, you've sent us a photo. Folks, if, if there's something that you're looking for advice on, um, and you would like to, uh, you would like to sort of describe it and and show us exactly what the damage looks like. This is an interesting one. It's got a hedge of lily pillies, um, fifteen meters by one meter high. Um, they're established, but you've noticed infestations of borers, and they're eating their way through the stems of the plant. And you can see this galling that's occurring on the on the, the actual stems there. Um, it's quite an unusual problem. And it basically means that you're going to need to use a systemic um, insecticide to take control of this. It's it's not a sort of thing that I would commonly see with lily pillies. The most common problem usually is things like scales. Um, what I would recommend you do is that you head into your local garden centre and talk to them about a systemic insecticide. Generally these days, um, there's some granulars that you kind of shake over the soil, water them in. They're taken up by the roots and they move through the sap. Now, when the borer lands and, and, and drills its hole and lays its eggs inside the, the stem under the bark, um, it's in contact with that sap and it'll generally kill off the eggs and stop that constant galling that you're seeing because that's what it is. It's developing these galls. What will happen is... If you don't treat it with time, you get more and more of them and the sap flow through the plant is interrupted, it ends up becoming quite stunted and woody and eventually um, you know, the plant will just fade away to nothing. So into your local garden centre, talk to them about systemic insecticides, what they've got, maybe even take that photo in and show them. It's always a good thing to do. John is in Sterling. Uh, what's a good fertiliser for olive trees in pots? Again, we're sticking to the same theme, aren't we? We're all seeing our plants starting to grow. We know that it's time to give them food. Now, olive trees do prefer a, a proper fruit fertiliser, and there are a number of them that are out there. But again, I, I would talk to your garden centre when you go in and pick it up, and I'd say to them, look, I've got olives. Um, if it was me at home, I would actually be using something at the moment that's probably organically based. Um, because they tend to be a little faster reacting in the short term and your olives, well, basically you're going to have fruit on the tree at the moment or you're about to get flower. So you've, you've probably just harvested, you're about to get flower. So the next few months is really the sort of period of time that olives are coming through. So mine at home, really, I should have picked them all by now, but I haven't. Um, and then I've got one tree, all the, all the fruit's gone, long gone, and it's just starting to produce uh, flowers. So my recommendation would be to go with something that has an organic base to it, but is a specialised fruit fertiliser. HL is in Perth, another one in the city. Um, I have some potted plants where I've applied liquid soil wetter on them. Uh, but still, when I'm but still when I water them, the water just seems to drain from the pots, like I wasted the water. What can I do? Well, it's an interesting thing. So there's probably a couple of things going on here, and you need to ha have a bit of a look at the the soil in your pots. If the plants are quite uh, root bound, if they're quite intense with roots in there, they might have taken a lot of the goodness out, and they might just it might be just a situation where that water is just draining through or running down the sides of the pots and not soaking in. Liquid soil wetters are generally, as a general comment, an exceptional way to get moisture into the heart. The other thing is you can get the granular forms um, and there's a number of them. And of course, what you want to do is get a water-wise accredited one. How do you find that? Well, you pop into the Water Corporation's website. It's probably the easiest thing to do. It's watercorporation.com.au forward slash waterwise. And you'll see a list of those recommended um, recommended wetting agents that are granular. And that's what you want to take a look at, I think. So get that on, give it a good water. Um, 
this time of the year, if they're quite root bound, as I sort of suggested before, maybe it's time to take the plant out and repot it and put it in some nice fresh soil. And the last thing that you can do and should consider doing is making sure you put some kind of organic mulch over the top of the soil of the pot. Now that's going to reduce the flow of water through that topsoil, giving the roots a bit more time to take up that that um, that moisture. So um, hopefully that helps. Well, we've got off to a pretty good start so far and uh, we've answered a lot of questions, but I thought maybe it's time we talk to an expert when it comes to, well, gardens broadly, but, but particularly also turf. Terry Selleck is from the Turf Growers Association of WA. Good morning, Terry. How are you? I'm good, Neville. How are you? I'm Trevor, but good, sorry, good sorry, point. <laughs> <laughs> normally, normally Nev would actually be, be in doing those sorts of things with us in the morning. He's um he's often a Winnebago, travelling around WA, enjoying the um the wildflowers at the moment though. Half his luck. Yes, half his luck. Sorry, mate. Yeah, that's all right. And how are you going? Going great. Um, you know. Uh, Things are starting to happen for us now. You know, winter's looks like it's coming to an end and spring is starting to to uh, bring us a bit of warm weather. So, you know, for yeah. our industry, the grass is starting to grow and we're actually starting to see the mowers start up now. So things are looking good. That's fantastic. It's been a lot of rainfall through the winter months and now we're moving into what is a, a drier period. Obviously, summer is when it really dries out and grass is actually motoring along and growing quite fast. What What's the sort of pattern we're on at the moment, are you guys? Do you need to water, or are we able to get by with the um, with the amount of rainfall we're getting? You know, two or three showers a week. Yeah, no, we're we're not uh, watering automatically yet at the moment at all. Um, basically, you know, we're monitoring each day um, what our soil moisture conditions are, and we're yep. only watering on an ads needs basis at the moment. Um, it's and that's not really that's really what people should be doing, whether it be lawn or whether it be gardens at the moment. There's no real need in in Western Australia, in the southern part of Western Australia, in my view, to, to be quite honest, all the way probably from Exmouth south to be turning any water on at the moment, any automatic irrigation on, because we're in a situation where um, we've got enough moisture in the soil, aren't we? Correct, yeah. I mean, you know, we were doing some works the other day and, you know, we've still got moisture all the way down three, four, five hundred mils. So um, the top's still nice and moist. The root zone was moist. Um, yeah, just not necessary to waste a valuable resource. Okay, so the, we had a 30 degree day um, last week. It was, it was a bit of an odd sort of day. It was one real hot one and then we've had moisture since then. Um, at what point do people need to think about turning the sprinklers on and do they just click it back into the full cycle or do you run on a, on a, on a lighter cycle? No, I think, you know, at the moment if, if you started to think that maybe your um, soil was drying out or you thought that the plant was starting to wilt, yep. um, it's probably just a good time just to run a manual um, run through on your on your irrigation system, you know, five, ten minutes maximum, I think, just to keep a little bit of, just a bit of a top up in your soil yep. um, and the plant should be fine and then go and switch it straight back to off. Yep. So so really at the moment, irrigation systems should definitely be in the manual mode, so um, not running automatically. And then um, really probably the most important thing, and you can see um, we're running a bit of vision just at the moment, but um, hand watering. Hand watering is the way to go. If, if, if things, if we get one hot day like we had last week and you start to see a few little dry patches, get out with a hose is the message, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, go out there, just give it a light sprinkle with your, um, you know, your hose. Um, and, you know, maybe now now's the time to start thinking about, you know, putting on that wetting agent application and, and setting your soil up ready for winter, uh, for summer. For summer, yeah. So would you would you actually be applying a wetting agent as a general comment, um, say, over lawns in particular at the moment? Most definitely. Um, you know, we've applied ours um, during August mm -hmm. um, to get it on. And, you know, we find that especially with our Bass and Dean sands that, it's it's easy to keep it moist rather than trying to re-wet it once it dries out. Um, yep. So we, we get our wetting agents on nice and early to make use of the, the moisture that's already in the soil. Fabulous, fabulous, Terry. That's um, it's great advice. Now, when it comes to when it comes to uh, turf varieties, um, there's some that uh, seem to be better. I noticed you know that there's a big difference between the turf varieties that you'll see on the east coast to, or certainly in the the cooler states on the east coast. Um, to what we would see generally here and certainly in the north. There's some varieties that are just better at handling hot, dry conditions, the conditions we get during the summer months, aren't there? 
yeah there sure is you know we we um you know we grow a, a fair few different varieties over here in wa all the turf growers from zoysias buffaloes kaikus different cooch varieties uh i know with some of our varieties uh you'd certainly see the differences in say the the zoysias um yep. you know they, they can tend to suffer a little bit more than say what the kaiku you might or, or the cooch grass you know seems to have um more tolerance to a bit of heat stress and that kind of thing yeah um, some of the buffalo varieties i think they're for the most popular ones they're fairly similar um they seem to they seem to not stand up as good as the coochers but once they get a little bit of a drink um they bounce back very quickly okay fantastic good advice now uh, i suppose the, the key message here that um that we want to make sure everybody's aware of terry is that people don't turn their irrigation systems on at the moment. It's not necessary. When when you do need to water, a bit of hand watering, that's all you're going to need to do, right? Absolutely, yeah, 100%. And, you know, probably like days like today, good idea to go outside, have a look at your sprinklers, clear them around, make sure there's nothing interfering with them. You know, when they pop up, make sure that they're clearing the top yep. of the turf, the nozzles are all working properly, everything's aligned, you know, all the sprinklers are the same. Um, you know, you don't have a rotator in there with a standard pop-up, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And just make sure you're delivering uniform water over the top of your turf. Brilliant advice, Terry Selleck. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate that. And I'll pass on my regards to Neville for you too. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> mate. <laughs> I love it. It's, that happens all the time. Don't worry, mate. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye. The... Um, there are so many questions flowing through. It's a really good advice there, though, that, that thing about water. We really don't need to be watering our gardens, but one of the most important things that I took from what Terry just provided then was to make sure that you're putting a wetting agent onto your, onto your lawn or onto your garden now, and it's not about um, making sure that the water is always consistently getting through the soil, but what is really important here, I think, is that that you do hold moisture in there because it's a lot harder to wet a soil later on than it is to keep it wet and that's where the benefit of putting wetting agents and being proactive in getting them in is so important now shall we um fly into some questions because we've got a few that are coming through and they're rippers actually vicky is in subiaco so i'm in subiaco right now and it looks beautiful here vicky um you wanted to ask a question about the systemic fungicide that you use on roses that uh, you think there's one that's granular. I'm not aware of a granulated um, fungicide. Um, generally, fungicides are applied over the foliage and um, it's all about pretty quick reaction. I'm going to give you a little bit of advice though. So for many years, I've got 150 roses in my garden up in the Perth Hills. And for many years, I suffered from quite bad outbreaks of black spot. And it happened to be that the garden was protected on either side by large shrubs. So there was not a lot of wind flow going through the garden, a lot of air moving in around those roses. It was quite almost humid at certain times. And that was when I was getting my, my significant outbreaks. The other thing that was occurring was occasionally we were getting on for the first couple of years, we we're getting a lot of rain or heavy moisture at night, this time of the year as new growth was emerging. And those two things are really significant problems. So I, I did a couple of things to change it so I don't have to apply fungicides. The first one was I actually removed some of those shrubs that were, were actually blocking airflow through. And I made sure that we could get a lot better movement of, of air in between those roses. That's a very important thing uh, for a start because that will reduce the level of, um, of spore that's moving from the fungus from plant to plant. The second thing was that I've made sure that we never have any water on those roses at night. So I can't do anything about rainfall, but I can certainly do things about irrigation or hand watering, never wet them at night. Two really important mechanical things that you can change that will really make a big difference. The third thing is that I added a complex fertilizer. So you can buy fertilizers that are predominantly NPK, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and potassium. And that is more than enough to keep your plants growing quite strongly as a general comment. But we are very much like plants. So if I have a diet that's lacking in calcium, I could be vulnerable to having osteoporosis. Or if I don't have enough vitamin C in my diet, I could develop scurvy. There are all these different types of diseases we get just through the lack of some core minerals or elements that we should be including in our diet. Plants 
are exactly the same. So I changed the type of fertilizer I use to using one that's got a base of 60 micro and macronutrients. It's the most complex you can get. And not only am I not getting any fungal problems, I am not getting any um, aphid attacks, which I used to also find a lot of aphid uh, infestation on new growth. And I'm, I'm getting nothing. In fact, I was looking at them just uh, just yesterday and I couldn't believe that there's not an aphid to be seen. Um, this is really about the plant being strong and healthy. And it's also vitally important that you use these kinds of fertilizers when you're growing edible plants. And the reason is, is that um, if we're eating the plant and the plant is, has not got those mineral or minerals or nutrients, well, then we're missing out on it in our diet. And, and that's a significant problem as well. So um, we have got we have got a lot of questions coming through. Please remember to hit the like button and um, I'm going to fly through some of these because uh, I think I'm going to have to move a bit faster. <laughs> Emma is in Rockingham. You've got two snow pears. Um, it's a, obviously a coastal garden. Rockingham's very alkaline soil. Um, when they had leaves before winter, they were yellowing with green veins. Some leaves were almost white. Can I help the trees or do they just not like alkaline soil? So you've hit it right on the right on the head. The soil will be, the pH will be um, too alkaline. So you need to counteract that. And there's two things you can do. So you can, you can look at changing by using sulfur-based fertilizers. Um, that will help a lot. Um, and it will slowly change the pH of the soil. may never change it enough, but it should change it a fair bit. Adding organics is like a buffer, so it tends to neutralise that. So mulching lots and lots around the base of those snow pears will make a big difference. The, the, the most important thing right at the moment is going to be to supplement the soil with iron. So those green veins, um, that's the iron left in the leaf. All the rest of the leaf is lacking that. So the chlorophyll is disappearing because plants need iron in the manufacture of chlorophyll. And that's why you're seeing the yellowing and the dark green veins in the leaves. So add some iron. Iron chelate is probably the fastest acting. But in the short term, I would actually suggest that maybe every three months you look at an application of iron sulfate. Remember the sulfate, acidic, that's going to help balance that pH out a little bit and deliver the iron the plants need as well on an ongoing basis. After 12 months, if you're not seeing a dramatic change in the colour of the leaves, it's highly possible but that the soil is just too alkaline and the trees are not going to perform and you may need to reconsider whether you have them or not. Um, again, the best source of information for this kind of stuff is your local WaterWise Garden Centre. If you can talk to them about it um, and show them what you're doing, they'll, they'll, I have no doubt they'll concur with my initial uh, you know, diagnosis, but it's the long term that's really important. Look at adjusting the soil pH. Dave's in Dun Craig. I just wanted the best way to remove weeds in brick paving. Well, look, the truth of the matter is there's some amazing um, weed sprays now that are naturally based. They use pelagonic acid, which is a, a naturally formed acid that comes from pelagoniums of all plants. Um, and uh, if you spray that over the top of the paving, it'll take the weeds out, it'll take moss out as well. Julia is in Kalamunda. My lawn's full of different weeds. I put grass seeds that have grown with the rainy weather, but now it's gone brown since it's been mowed. Um, in summer, this lawn looks terrible. So. It's the, the, the short answer, Julia, is that applying a weed and feed, a general hose on weed and feed fertiliser is going to take out a lot of those broader leaf weeds. But some of those weeds that you're probably seeing are things like winter grass and also bindi. And it's probably too late to take the bindi out. You might still be able to treat bindi before it, it produces seed, but the winter grass um, has definitely started dropping seed already. So... One year seeds generally leaves you with seven years weeds. It's an old gardening story and you are going to have to look at a selective herbicide, but you want to do it ideally in around the sort of, well, July at the latest probably next year. And it's worth making a note in your diary. Put it in, say, I need to put a selective herbicide through and that'll make a big difference. Sorry for that spectacular little bit of noise there. Um, so I hope, hopefully that helps. Now, Julia um, has got a second question for us. My garden's full of caterpillars and grasshoppers. What can I do? Um, 
grasshoppers is interesting because uh, I'm not seeing too many of them, but I have heard a few people saying that they've got very large grasshoppers doing a fair bit of damage at the moment. And um, I was talking to Sue McDougall about this recently, and, and she recommends manually going around and pulling them off by hand. There are some baits that you can buy. So there's a, a grasshopper and cricket bait from David Grace. It's basically a bram bait. Um, I would be very careful in applying that. The active ingredients are pretty toxic kind of chemical, but it does take out grasshoppers when they're in plague proportions. If they're not in plague proportions, go and remove them by hand. Caterpillars, well, there's a couple of really good naturally based derived, um, they're bacterially derived uh, treatments for caterpillars that just upset their digestive process and stop them from eating your plants. One's called Diapel, the other one's called Success, and um, both of them very, very effective. Eileen is in Midland. What's wrong with my azalea? Some have got very small leaves and are mottled. You've probably got azalea lace bug and you're in Midland. I'd be popping down to uh, down to Guildford um, Nursery. Do, yeah, sorry, just have a look there. Sorry, you're moving so much, Michaela. I lost it for a second there. I'd be pop popping down to, um, down to Guildford and having a chat to Joe and the team because there's a couple of different treatments for that with azaleas and it does need to be treated. It's probably, the damage is probably done, but you can break the population so that it doesn't do so much damage um, next time around. And uh, probably the other thing is that if the leaves are very, very small, they probably need a feed. Um, I hope that helps, Eileen. Uh, Christine is in Stirling. Good morning, Christine, and uh, thank you for your greetings. I ended up spot treating the creeping oxalis in my palmetto lawn. Obviously, they're now dead patches in the lawn. I'm wondering how long it will take for the lawn to grow again. You've treated it with some mineral magic, and I'm hoping that that will help um, help the soil, and I'm assuming some fertiliser will be required. So, look, with mineral magic, so that that's um, biogenic amorphic silica, uh, that is a product that if it's in the soil, it's really good. You do not want it on the surface of the soil, though, because it's got this natural absorbency, so it's going to draw moisture out of the soil. So be very, very careful with something like that. Christine, what I would be recommending you do is if you put some down, I'd get the garden fork out and I would um, be forking as many holes as I can and I'd wash and try and get it to wash into the ground. Um, really, the key is not applying something like that, which is a soil improver. What you need to do is you need to feed your lawn. Now is the time to get the lawn growing. And as the weather gets warm, as the days, there's more sunlight hours in the days, we're so lucky to live where we are. Um, lawns love those conditions. So now is the time to be applying a good all-round lawn fertiliser. There's some great ones out there, so, so check it out and um, and give it a good feed. That's the trick. Eve is in Jandicott. Do any WA natives require water-saving crystals in the planting hole? I wondered if this would help with our long, hot summers. Water-saving crystals, as a general comment, um, are very helpful for plants that do not have well-developed root systems. And if it's a WA native, they've evolved in our soils naturally. They really don't need those sorts of things added. The important thing is that, that you do try and get their root system as established as you can and probably just a chunky mulch over the top of the soil. So again, head to the Water Corporation's website um, forward slash WaterWise and check out the product range of WaterWise mulches. Um, you want ideally a big bark, chunky bark mulch. It reduces the it reduces the evaporation, but it, it sort of insulates the soil. So it leaves moisture in there longer. And if your plants are only just establishing, it'll give them a chance to, um, to I suppose, get through their first summer. Uh, I will make one point about, uh, about watering uh, WA natives. And that is that once you've got them established, you shouldn't need to necessarily hand water them definitely not irrigate them again because they've evolved in our environment they're able to handle our long hot summers and long periods of time without rainfall so sometimes in actual fact irrigating them can cause more problems all right uh ryan everyone we've got somebody joined us from melbourne that's okay we've got a couple of uh, questions coming from melbourne elocations are very prone to spider mites how do i prevent infestation in the first place so the best thing you can do, Ryan, is to get yourself some predatory mites. So there are um, predatory insects that you can get. I would Google it online. Um, and uh, the, the, the first source of information is a website called The Good Bugs. 
um, check that out. They have um, a good list of the people that pr provide them. They're actually bred just north of Perth um, and also in Adelaide, and then shipped all over the country. But that's the way to solve your spider mite problem. Um, it really is just a, a pest that once it's um, once it's established and its populations are quite large, it's hard to um, to slow down. But bring in the predatory pests, and there'll, there'll be some there, but they'll always be in balance. Fiona is in serpentine that's back here in the west. Is it still okay to wet us all the garden now while it's so wet? Well, the little bit of advice we had before from Terry was that, um, yeah, look, this is a great time of the year to be getting... Uh, making sure you've got a wetting agent down. They did it for their turf in August. So definitely get it in now. It's just making sure that the soil doesn't dry out, that it does uh, absorb every drop that basically um, falls between now and, and the, the really long dry period of summer. Jennifer is in Melbourne. My quinces are in bloom. What do I spray to make sure there's no little black grubs getting into the fruit? Jennifer, um, don't spray anything because uh, it, it really the black grubs you're probably talking about a fruit fly and they're not going to occur until the fruit's fully developed and then at that point in time you'll need to look at a fruit fly spray look at the number of questions we've got coming through we'll do one more kim is in secret harbor i've got a very large backyard of buffalo it's constantly full of weeds it has lots of bare patches some lush patches and some patches that are growing but not nice and green how can i improve the whole lawn please there's a really good um top dressing that you can apply. So Secret Harbour, pretty sandy soils. It would seem to me, and this happens quite a lot, that we don't go and invest in developing the soil, getting it. So the biggest investment you can make for a garden before you plant anything is in your soil. So get lots of organics in there, get maybe a clay base in there. So something like um, Soil Solver or one of those uh, kale and clay products, mix them into the soil get it consistently throughout the soil, then lay your turf, and you will always have a lush green lawn. Retrospectively, you can apply soil solver, soil solver over the top of the soil and wash it in, in, over your lawn basically, and wash it in, and it will help to some extent. But to be quite honest, really, um, what you're probably going to need to do now, Kim, is just be applying fertilizers. So um, fertilizing on a regular basis, and mowing, that's the best way to get rid of weeds. Keep mowing, can't go wrong. Wow, there's so many questions flying through. I think we need to um, need to go to our next guest though. So I've got uh, Merrick Carter joining us. He's a head designer and irrigation design consultant at Waterwise Landscaping. Good morning to you, Merrick. G'day, Trevor. How are you? Not too bad at all on this fine spring day. It is spectacular. I can see the big Waterwise logo on your uh, on your shirt. Tell us a little bit about Waterwise Landscaping and the type of work you guys do. What we try to do, or what we do as a, a group, is um, provide landscaping and irrigation packaging to new home builds, new estates like Atlantis Beach Two Rock, um, yep. and some of Perth's largest builders. So, what we try to do is bring um, the Waterwise ideas yep. and um, supplement that into builders so that they are providing a uh, better designed landscape with their homes. So when we talk about design, there's there's a few different elements to design. There's obviously the actual physical design, how it's laid out, and then there's there's also the products you use within that design. And they, right. you know, some, some things some things vary depending on the purpose. Tell us a little bit about how you maybe work out your hydro zoning. So what we'll look at is when we're sort of looking at a house, we're trying to work out what the client's needs might be and then create a irrigation system that will tailor where we're planting, what we're planting, um, and then try and make sure that that is running in such a way that it's not overpressured or underpressured and then yep. that causes its own inherent problems. Yes. <clears throat> so... Um... I wanted to ask you, because uh, we've just had some images um, on the screen for people to see about, you know, obviously systems coming on. You're using different different, um, different sprinklers, for example, on lawns to compared to garden beds. Um, do you want to talk through why that is? Uh, well, yeah. Well, I mean, when you're watering a lawn, you're trying to be really specific at how you're getting that water to the ground. 
Mm-hmm. The Lord really wants a perfect 10 mil of water across its entire surface. If it doesn't get that, it gets quite dry in places and then you get those yellowing dry spots appearing. Yeah. Uh, where a garden, it's more about trying to hit the foliage of the plants and cause that water to drop into the root zones or deep mm-hmm. zones, exactly like rainfall. So different types of watering for each sort of area that you're uh, trying to water as such. Yep. Now, when it comes to working out what sprinkler um, goes in, where and, and, and how long it runs for, this is all controlled by, by a controller. And um, irrigation controllers have evolved massively in probably the last five years. The technology is amazing. Tell us about what you're, what you're doing in that space now. Right now, like these weather-based or Wi-Fi controllers are probably the greatest thing that the irrigation sort of manufacturers have created. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant in the sense that they are taking information from weather stations around sort of your your local area and sort of adapting the controller to suit what's going on in that area. And then secondly, when it comes to a maintenance sense, you're able to be out in the lawn fixing a sprinkler instead of going to and from your controller, yeah, you just sit there on your phone, turn it on, see work done. It's magic, isn't it? That's um, mm. it's probably one of the most exciting things because I've got a quite a large garden, and um, you know, inevitably, um, there'll be something I've got to do it long distance away. And once upon a time, it was manually turn it on, run down, check if it's working properly, adjust it, go back, turn it off. You know, it was this back and forth all the time and, and up and down a hill. It was driving me crazy. So the Wi-Fi controllers have changed everything. Now, tell me that there's obviously a lot of um, a lot of work being done on sprinklers and the way they deliver. So we've got different patterns, haven't we? We do, yeah. So once upon a time, we all used to see our lawns being in gardens water with sprays and mm-hmm. the pop-up would pop up and throw that water out immediately. Now we're seeing, and we prefer when we're putting systems in, is to use the rotary style nozzle, which is a stream of water that rotates left to right or right to left, depending on the brand. And that delivers the water in a very slow and controlled manner. So regardless of wind strength flowing against them, they are (laughs) delivering that water exactly like what you would get in a rainfall situation. But to get that 10 mil of water to the ground, it takes a long time, but it mm-hmm. saturates a larger area. So they're brilliant at what they do. Yeah, it's, it's, it really is quite clever, isn't it? And it's that you, you raised the point previously, but it's about that consistent delivery, consistent amount of water all over the whole lawn. There's two things that do that. One is great design so that you're getting head-to-head coverage. Uh, exactly. from sprinkler to sprinkler but but uh, the second thing is obviously making sure that the the sprinkler itself is delivering and that's where that technology comes in mate um i know we've got questions coming in left right and center at the moment but i did want to ask you um your five top tips for right now when it comes to irrigation systems what people don't need to be turning them on at the moment do they no they don't need to be um and with the wi-fi controller now is the time to sort of on your watering day if you are looking at your like garden and you can see it starting to suffer quickly turn it on and Mm -hmm. run it for that but while it's on run through your system and look at all the areas that may not be working properly there may be blockages a zone might not be working so Mm -hmm. now is the perfect time to make sure that the system is perfectly running so that come the warmer months everything's the way that it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Great advice. Another sort of really good tip right now is to make sure that you've got your controllers set to about 50% of its runtime because we're going to want to start to put a little bit of water on, just not mm-hmm. a lot of water. Yep. Terrific. That's great advice, Merrick. Thank you very much for for joining us this morning. I think um, we've covered off a lot of great points here and it's certainly um, it's uh, the time to be making sure that uh, you don't have any broken sprinklers, that you, any work, if they're blocked, if there's any work that needs to be done, do your maintenance, but don't turn your sprinklers on. Do a bit of hand watering and occasionally maybe run them if we do have uh, a run of warm weather. But we've still got a couple of months, I think, before we're into that. We've had a lot of rainfall 
Uh, soil moisture levels are great. So uh, really good advice, mate. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. All right. That's, uh, that's a great bit of advice there from Merrick. And it's um, one of those things, if you want to learn more about WaterWise irrigation products, probably one of the best uh, websites you can go to is the smartwatermark.org forward slash products. Now, there's a huge amount of research done on WaterWise irrigation products on that website. So it is smartwatermark.org forward slash products. Check it out. Okay. I am going to fly into some of these questions and then I really do want to get Joe Harris joining me because Joanne has been so patient sitting here waiting and listening to what's going on. Let's uh, go to Ardros. Aruni is an Ardros. You've got saffron bulbs. They're growing well in a pot, but now they're drying. Do you know why this would be? Because I've been checking and they are well watered. I would suspect that at the moment, if it's saffron bulbs that uh, and they're drying out, that you might need to be giving that water, that uh, soil a good dose of, of wetting agent. And the reason I'm saying that is because um, it's very unusual that they would be drying out. We have had a few drier days. It is warming up. And the first thing that's going to show that is pots. So it's probably an indication that the soil is probably not quite right. Get a wetting agent in there. Give it a good drench. And that should hopefully stop that decline. Diana is in Swan View. I've got clay soils there. Hollyhocks seem to attract a lot of pests, especially large grasshoppers. And there's some small ones there as well. Well, if you've got big ones, you're definitely going to have small ones, um, which then they go in and they eat everything else in the garden. How do I get rid of the hollyhocks? My garden's only 12 months old. Look, I would suggest that maybe you, um, again, you're in Swan View, so you could pop down to, um, down to Guildford, um, garden centre and, and just pop uh, pop in and have a chat to Joe. I, I would suggest to you that maybe the solution is not to get rid of the hollyhocks, but maybe to make sure that the hollyhocks are not acting as a primary food source for pests. Um, and the simple thing to do there is, again, to use a um, systemic insecticide uh, so that anything that's chewing on them uh, no longer does that. And um, that's probably the simplest thing. You can get those David Gray uh, grasshopper and cricket baits as well if it's um, if it's grasshoppers. It's interesting. We've had a few people pointing out that they've got quite a few grasshoppers around. I wonder if that's a, um, a common thing at the moment. Jeanette joins us and she's coming in from Queensland. Hello, Jeanette. I've got frangipanis that have got curly leaf late in the season prior to leaf fall and it's starting to leaf now. Do I need to spray them and when to stop it from occurring? Well, Generally, curly leaf would only occur if you're getting mites um, on your frangipanis. So it would be unlikely that any damage is done in the early stages, the new growth that's coming out. It will be later in the season when things start to really become very dry that you might have that issue. And there's probably two ways that you can get control of mite, that type of mite damage. Um, one is that you can use a... Um, a systemic insecticide. The second thing is that you could introduce predatory mites, which would be my preference. And I did mention the Good Bug um, website previously. Do some research. Check it out. They send them to you in a tube in the mail and uh, you release them into the garden. And if there's any any uh, red spider mite or two spotted mite out there that's in the garden at the moment, the, the predators will go to them and feed off them. And it kind of works out this lovely natural symbiotic relationship between the good bugs and the bad bugs and the, the bad bugs don't do too much damage. Um, and we do need to have a balance. So this is a nice natural way to do it. Staying in Queensland just for one second, we've got a heap of gardenias. Oh. Uh, so one of my standard plants leaves are turning yellow and dropping. Both are in pots. I've used controlled release Osmocote. What am I doing wrong? Gardenias have very high um, demand for uh, really two of the three major greening agents. Iron, magnesium are two of them, and obviously nitrogen is the other one. Um, Osmocote's got a good, generally as a general comment, a pretty good supply of all of them. But these plants sometimes needed to be supplemented. Now, if they're just yellowing and it's not dark green veins and the leaves are yellowing, it's highly likely it's magnesium that you're lacking. And magnesium is simply applied by using Epsom salts. So a couple of big heaped tablespoons of Epsom salts 
in a couple of liters of water, mix it right up, and then water it in. So make sure it's fully dissolved and then water it in over the foliage of the plant. You'll actually see quite a dramatic change within just say three to four weeks in the in the, the intensity of the green and the leaves. Um, they'll go from that sort of yellowy cold sort of looking effect, which um, the cold does affect um, uh, gardenias as far as their ability to uptake some of these greening agents. So you'll you'll see a big turnaround. I, I would suggest that you take the Epsom salts um, treatment and that should work pretty well. Monica is in Gippsland in uh, Victoria. I've had a Hoya for the last five years. How do I get it to flower? Hoyas are a funny thing. They can um, really, they can really, Joe, come and join us. They can uh, really, um, kick in and and take off and they they do all sorts of amazing sorts of things um but they can sit there for a long period of time joe you got any tricks on hoyas uh not on hoyas no no <laughs> <laughs> what i tend to find with with hoyas in my garden is that the more root bound the plant gets the yeah. more it's likely to produce flowers um when they're when they're in really fresh new soil they produce all this growth but not a lot of um, not a lot of flowers. So I, I tend to think that if you've got it in a pot, let it get a little bit root bound if you can. Um, and if not, you could always use a flower promoting fertilizer, can't you? Absolutely, and not mm. too much sun. Yeah, there you go. Certainly great advice. Not too much sun. So we've got Joanne Harris joined us. It's great. Joe's been uh, yeah. listening in as we've been going along. She's the owner of Guildford Garden Centre. Been running the centre for twenty years now. No, no longer. Longer. Next March, it'll be 30. 30 years. Yeah. Time flies when yeah. you're having fun, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Joe's been uh, president of the nursery and garden industry in Western Australia, been an active member of the industry for many, many years. I think you've been to every garden week that there's ever been and other permeation of it. Not so many recently. Mm -hmm. Not so many recently. Um, but, yeah, we've, we were certainly there a lot in the 90s and, and early 2000s. Joe, will you tell yeah. us a little but bit? But I still support it completely yes. it's a great great platform for our industry oh it's fantastic yeah. and look it's just this great chance for everybody who loves gardens to yeah. see the best garden centers in the state all in one location on yeah. one period of time and it's a great place to showcase all our plants so mm. if the garden centers actually can't get there uh, we're showcasing it through the wholesalers through the growers so we've still got a really good representation of what we what we're producing and what we've got out there for the the um, I think public. I think I've been um, attending garden centres, you know, visiting uh, uh, sorry garden weeks um, in their different forms because we've got the Perth Garden yeah. Festival and then the uh, yes flower and garden, so, flower show, and garden show garden so, week which so there's I been keep those referring things. to it but, as and I I can't help that that's that's my yeah. um, my habit but um, one of the things I've always loved about it and, and you really I think were probably one of the big leaders when you were consistently attending is that every year there'd be a fabulous new plant that would come through you know yeah. the blue ginger or yes. the snail creeper or there's yeah. always something amazing isn't yeah. there? Yeah. yeah absolutely it's a great place to to showcase the new releases but also to get great information you know that's where you've got all the you know you've got people like yourself mm. Sue McDougall um, all sorts of people down there that can give you the best information that's possible you know gardening I always say is not rocket science it's not you just need some good quality information mm. and that's where you can find it and I, I always say you've got to listen to your plants too because they will tell yeah. you if there's something wrong they'll actually show you what it is now yeah. can we talk a little bit about water wise gardening and water wise garden centers um guildford is a water wise garden center tell us yeah. a little bit about it well it's about training up your staff and having great knowledge on uh what is water wise what what is going to work and we're a huge state uh, so um, the girls and, and the guys that work with us, they really need to know what uh, the first question they'll ask you, for instance, is whereabouts are you? Mm -hmm. We need to know what suburb you're in, what sort of soil you're in, what conditions you are. Because what we'll sell for somebody up in the hills is very different to what we'll sell for somebody on the coast. Mm. Um, we get people calling us and through our website, we get people coming in from Albany right up to Broome. So you have to have a really good knowledge and ask all the questions. Um, for what is required. Um, it means that what we have is we've got a responsibility also to the community to provide them with plants that are going to work well, mm -hmm. that are not going to use our precious resources as in water mm -hmm. and not 
do any damage to the environment. So that's really important that we have that. And Joe, uh, you know, one of the things that I know you guys do really well is that you've you've got a very wide range of plants, not just um, West Australian natives or Australian mm -hmm. natives, but plants that come from other parts of the world. But all those plants, you guys know how to get the best results out of them in our environment, in our climate. Yeah. And that then allows you to provide tips on uh, for the person when they come in and they buy it mm. on getting the very best result. Vitally important part of, of gardening, isn't it, to know what Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. And I think that people often refer to, uh, they'll come in saying, I want a water-wise garden, garden, so therefore I want a native. And I say to them, well, look, natives are fantastic for that, but it's not just a native that will give you a water-wise garden. Mm. And I think um, I've often said right from the beginning when we were called water restrictions way back when, Mm -hmm. um, was um, I always said it's not what you plant it's how you plant it mm -hmm. so you can have a water wise fern which we would not consider to be water wise plant mm. but if you put it in the right conditions plant it correctly using good water wise products you're going to have a water wise plant yeah so there's principles and there's yeah. products right so this is probably one of the very first things that um, that people need to know when they go in so I always say that um, I, I look at my garden I always remember my wife we moved to to the hills Perth Hills and we had this this property that had been pretty much run down it had 38 of the 44 declared weeds in western <laughs> australia growing on it and uh, there were a lot of jobs to do so it was a fire risk there was lots to do and um, my wife sort of said to me it was a couple of acres she said well um what's your budget and i said well it's this much money and uh, she said oh okay that's great um okay well look, let's let's do that so we allocated that money she's the accountant in the family so that was a big deal for her and uh, i remember standing on the deck looking out over all this black dirt and <laughs> irrigation system and just going, wow, look at this, this is fantastic. And she's looking and she's going, but we spent 80% of the budget on the dirt. And I said, yeah, I know, but isn't it great dirt? And, yeah. <laughs> and I looked around and she had tears streaming down her face. She's like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> but everything that went in yeah. performed. And it's this investment in the soil is probably one of the most critical things. Absolutely. I often say to people when they come in, the foundation of anything. You build a great foundation, whether it's a garden, a house, your children, mm -hmm. you put the foundation in, you will get good results. So, and there are uh, young gardeners, and I don't mean young in age, I mean um, inexperienced gardeners mm -hmm. that will come up and they'll have a huge trolley full of wonderful plants and they're all water wise and they're going to work well for them, but they haven't considered that they need to have um, some sort of compost, uh, mulch, mm -hmm. so maybe some wetting agent or some clay to put in a really sandy soil. Yep. And we'll often say to them, look, put these plants back and then you can afford this also. Yep. Next week, come back and get these plants and you'll still have some more of these yep. products that can work for you. Most important So advice. it's really important. Okay. So foundation, consider your foundation, consider your soil. So when you talk about soil amendments, um, let's say, you know, typically people are, whenever they kind of write into us, They'll say, I've got a clay soil or I've got a sandy soil. But there's yeah. actually three different types of sandy soil profiles on the Perth sand plain alone, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. So, so Bass and Dean sands are some of the most challenging in the world. But, well, they say that, mm. yes. I remember the World Health Council came out with and said, and I live in the middle of Bass and Dean, mm. and it was like, great, I've got the worst soil <laughs> in the world. So it's a matter of feeding without overfeeding. It's a matter of putting in the right um, soil conditioners, um, you know, you cannot just throw a plant into a bassendine sand mm -hmm. and expect it to survive. Well, it can actually survive. It can survive, but you're going to pay for an awful lot of water yep. and you're going to waste a lot of water. Mm -hmm. So there's just no point doing that. So what advice would you give somebody who's living in the Bassendine sands mm -hmm. um, at, with regards to amending their, their sand or their soil yeah. to, to make it a good growing soil? What would okay. they? What would you recommend? Well, not everyone can afford to uh, do the whole of the, the soil at the time. Mm -hmm. So I suggest that if you have a pot, let's say it's as big as this glass, mm -hmm. right, or it's your, your pot size is this size, that's your whole size. Double at least double the size yep. of the pot, and for the depth, mm -hmm. right? And a third of that, put in some good compost, mm -hmm. right? Mix it together, backfill it, plant into it, mulch it, and of course maintain it with some wetting agent. Because we get a very waxy surface on the top of the mm -hmm. bassendine sand. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessary to use the wetting agent um, each time you plant. 
but use it when you require it. And I mm. think that's important with anything that we don't overuse some of these products. Yep. There's no, there's no need. Yep. Um, great advice. But yeah, so so make sure that you get really good compost in it and, and some great mulch. Don't forget the mulch. It's always important here in WA. Yeah. Um, now, right next door to where you are, um, there's also quite heavy clays. We've got, you know, the sort of almost salt pan in some places and then, you know, mm. heavy, thick clays. Yeah. What, what do people do in that instance? Because it's a rare bit of advice that you would be giving in WA Sorry. for people with heavier soils. Well, in Guildford, it's like road base. Mm. It's heavy, heavy. I think you could make really good pots out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, when you're using, um, when you're uh, gardening in somewhere like Guildford or anywhere with the clay, um, it, gypsum becomes your friend. Mm -hmm. right? So gypsum is a product that can open the, the clay particles and allow the nutrients, the roots, or the roots to go down and to start with to establish well. And it'll allow um, the nutrients and the water to follow. Okay. Um, so it's really important that you use um, some clay. That can be used whilst you're planting mm -hmm. or it can be used retrospectively. Okay. Right? So you can um, spread that on the, the soil and the water will take it down for you right. as you water it in. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Um, again, you should use some um, compost. Um, not as much as you'd need in a place in a sandy soil, at least, mm -hmm. but you certainly still need some compost, good compost. And it does break it up, and it provides obviously food for yeah. uh, those microbes and worms and Absolutely. things like that that are so yeah. important to healthy soil. Absolutely. All right, so we've gone through uh, some amendments for for pretty poor quality sand, and we've gone for heavy clay. Let's talk about plants now. You brought some in with you, and uh, there's a an interesting mix because when yeah, you know, a lot of people think, oh. Um, if it's got, if it's water wise, it's got to be a native, right? That's the first thing. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be native. They can no. be exotic too. So they can come from other yeah. places in the world that go through similar environments. Because we often talk about our climate as being a Mediterranean climate. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of plants that originate from Mediterranean regions that do really well here, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, and I think we, it, the other thing with uh, water wise plants is there are water wise plants that actually verge on being weeds. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful about where we put those sort of plants the first one i was going to talk about and here it is oh, here it's beautiful is your limonium or it's the perennial status mm -hmm. all right um now this one is uh you know if you're in york you have to be rather careful if you use it i've seen it growing all through york oh um, really oh yeah so seeding it self sows really really easily wow so again it can be a little bit weedy the flowers are amazing um it's a low, you show. hold that for I'll me. Sh I'll show the You do the holding. Buds. Yeah, yeah thanks. So. Um, I meant to bring some um, because they flower almost all year round. Probably winter time would be when they don't flower so much. Um, and this, they have this a, is a, a, probably a lighter blue, but you can get quite intense sort of yeah, purple blue. Can't this you? one should, I, I think um, often labels are a little bit misleading, aren't mm -hmm. they? And this label I don't think is, is very good. The flower is really intensely purple. Right. Um, in fact, a young girl that works with me is um, is uh, getting married next week, and she's using the flower heads for confetti. Oh, so wow. we've been I've been cutting all of my flowers off my um, my limonium. These are great in uh, you can spot plant them around, uh, you can mass plant them. I've used them in pots; they look fantastic. Um, they're they're very very drought tolerant. Once in there, um, twice a week all you need yeah brilliant yeah. great plant in all the right. right spot so so there's one that oh the other thing with those too sorry yeah. yeah is that you can buy them at certain times of the year you can buy them in in punnets so it makes them really economical and it's great for mass planting oh okay yeah That's a great so idea. you get six plants in a punnet which is fantastic mm. yeah all right a very very good water wise plant particularly if you want to have um if it's, a lot of people love that cottage garden effect yeah. And, and you don't have to go for English cottage garden plants. No. You can actually no. go for these that originate from Mediterranean regions that are exceptionally yeah. good at creating the effect, right? Yeah. Love it. I'll pass that Love one it. on. What else have you got for us, Joe? Okay. Well, let's go with um, the next one that I've got here, which is uh, Kakala. Now, it's a great little ground cover. It's uh, native to WA. Kakala will grow around about 50 centimetres high and about three metres wide. Um, often known as pig face or ice plant. That's what I knew as a, yeah. as a kid. But um, this one's Kakala been, is the, is is the Noongar name, right? Uh, 
Is it yes, Noongar? it's yeah. one of the Noongar names. Yeah. There's actually two, and don't ask me what the other one is because okay. I can't right. pronounce it. <laughs> I tried last night. Um, fabulous flower on this. It's a little daisy flower, probably a little bit bigger than a 50-cent piece, um, and it has these uh, magenta uh, pink flowers that are great. Uh, the entire plant can be eaten. The entire above ground part of the plant yep. can be eaten. So the leaves can be um, eaten fresh in a salad. Um, they can be sauteed lightly and used um, in cooking, you know, in, in uh, I don't know, a, a vegetable dish of some sort. And then um, the flower even can be eaten, but mm -hmm. the fruit that comes in after the flower apparently is the best part of it, and it tastes very much like a fig. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I've not tasted the flower yet. Oh, I've fine. had the, the things, the leaves. The leaves are also known a little bit like celery is a great substitute, yeah. salt substitute for okay. plants too. So is it a bit of a salty sort of flavour to it? Yeah, yeah. a salty flavour to it, okay. and it, it helps with the, the bringing out the flavour of other things in you. In your um in your dishes, uh, really really a great verge plant, mm -hmm. really really drought tolerant. You know, plant it once established, and that's the other thing I think with water wise plants, people think they can just throw them in and they're going to be water wise and that's fine. Yep. They're not. They're babies. They're living things. You need to establish them and then they'll be water wise for you. Yeah, I, look, we planted this at the Water Corporation's um, headquarters in Leaderville as one of the plants because there's some yeah. sandy spots there where water and they're on on a slope and water just will yeah. run off it's almost impossible it yes. took them probably two years to establish and now they're, they're just, fantastic yeah. they've found their yeah. their spot and they're really good but yeah it's it's that two years of just making sure we're we're protecting them giving them a little bit of hand watering mm -hmm. just making sure they're okay and then once they're established they don't need any watering at all. Now that the water corp know they're edible, you might have to go and replace them. Yeah, I know. I know. It's actually the gardens there are looking magnificent at the moment. That's um, one yeah. of my um, one of my favourites. Let's go okay. for something a bit different. Well, this one here is a, a little new release that came Ooh. out a couple of years ago, um, and it's the Daiichi's Mini Ballerina. Um, this little guy, it's it's a Really good little substitute for some of the uh, native grasses and the grasses that we um, we like to grow in. It's a great little pocket plant. If mm. you've seen it in flower, the entire plant just becomes full of really? flowers out from it. Um, Daisies um, again are almost a weed in certain situations. Show what the flower looks like too. Yeah. That's, you can see the, on the label there. Um, how beautiful that is. That's really beautiful. It's a creamy flower with a little um, orangey-brown splotch on each petal. Um, Gorgeous. Common name is um, it's the iris. Yes. Yeah, so... so African iris. African, African or, iris. Yeah, yeah, so. um, it's great. It flowers profusely and very, very water-wise. Great for a pot. Um, I've seen people growing them indoors in a very light area. Really? Not sure how well it would flower unless you've got it in a really, in, uh, a really different. easy, yeah. you know, really good, well lit area. But uh, this would be a wonderful border plant, or if you just want a, a nice low growing yeah. um, garden, this is the perfect. Well, one. a lot of people don't want things like agapanthus, but mm. they want that low. This reminds me a little bit like um, the snowball agapanthus, the little yes. dwarf mm. one. Yeah that has this profuse flowers. I actually had uh, not the dwarf one, but the bigger one in my garden, and I didn't know. It was two years after I'd moved in, oh. and we demolished this little area, a, a pump for the pool, yep. uh, the pump shed, and behind it were two um, uh, dieties growing oh. that I'd never watered, I'd never touched, wow. and they were happily sitting there. So it's an incredibly water-wise garden uh, right. plant. Yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, we go to... Um, Maybe what? What about if we go to the grevillea? Because at the moment, yeah. um, everybody's looking for flower. They, these are great. This is yeah. this um, really has been one of the most popular. I, I might pop the flower the label up. Yeah, on the label up so you can so see. So it's a it's a pinky, a little pinky cream flower. Um, I like this. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I really like this one. One, it's a low growing plant. So mm -hmm. again, it it's um, I think it's around about thirty centimeters high by about. Uh, a metre wide. I'm not going to I check. I think it's got I'm a spread sure. of about a metre, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it's. I like the leaf. Often, you know, grevilleas can be quite harsh on the skin. A lot of people can have a reaction to them. But this one is soft. It's one of what they call the woolly leaf. So it's a really soft little plant and easy to grow and it profusely flowers. One of the things I like about this is that 20 cents from every sale 
goes towards Free the Bears. Oh, that's great. So it? I think it kind of yeah. adds back into the community yeah. and adds something else yeah. to it. Yeah. Well, um, woolly, woolly Bear Hero, it's a gravillia, yeah. um, and Full Sun. Absolutely Full Sun. It will take a bit of part shade because, mm -hmm. of course, in Perth, Full Sun is really Full Sun. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if, if maybe if you're in Melbourne and you're listening in Melbourne today, um, Maybe I wouldn't um, put it in shade in Melbourne, but no. certainly in Perth you can put it in a bit of morning sun. Um, the other thing with that too is the fertiliser. You want to stay below 3% phosphorus uh, with any of your, your natives. You yep. want to be careful about what you do with your Good advice. So those, those. those native, um, specialised native plant fertilisers, the general yeah. comment will always have that as a as the, yeah. the limit to what's what's going yeah, to be About 1.7 1, 1. I think is about the... the this one over here, this next one you've got, no, I was going to, going to go to this because at the moment we, we do a food show um, here at Guru Productions as well yeah. and all the chefs, they're all into saltbush at the moment. So yes. using the foliage of saltbush, this is a really interesting one. Tell us a little yeah. bit about it. I love this one. I love grey plants, the accent that it gives into a garden. In fact, I'm renovating my house at the end of the year and I want to renovate my garden too and I've got this plan to put this underneath a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, Oakville Crimson Spire trees, oh, which have nice. the bronze coloured leaf, mm -hmm. and then use this as a hedge under that wow. and clip it and then have a little green hedge. So layer it That'll and have the three beautiful. colours. So you get the, the, yeah. the distinct colours. Now just tell me a little yeah. bit about how big this gets. So this one, it's interesting. I was Because I don't know this plant particularly well, yeah. I haven't grown it yet, um, and when I did some research on it, they say anywhere from 1.2 to 2 metres. Mm. Um, but most people, and some of the research I did with the people I know I can rely on their research, yep. um, I think if you keep it around about one metre and you tip prune it because it can get woody. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to let it take off. If you do, you're going to probably have to plant, underplant it to yep. really make it look good. Um, Interestingly, you raised this point before, but um, it, it's important to remember that a lot of these labels are actually made on the East Coast and yeah. they'll often refer to conditions over there, not to West Coast conditions. I, but there's mm. two, always two classics I use. So remember when... Um, Magnolia teddy bear first came out. Yes. Um, the, the breeder at the time, um, he sent me a, a few plants to put in my garden. He said, four metres maximum. Well, they've got to be eight to nine metres now. <laughs> They're massive. And uh, it's, a you know, yeah. it's a beautiful plant and I love it and everything else. But if I was planting for that reason that I only wanted it to that height, it would have been a, a bit, yeah. of, bit of a bad mistake. And the label still says 4.5 metres maximum height. Yeah. And the other one was um, Pinkerbell, which is a West Australian apple. Yes. And uh, that, again, was a, a four-metre tree that um, is at least six, six. and a half in my, yeah. my garden. Yeah. So it performs differently. And, and a lot of that's because whilst we might have challenging summers with it being hot and dry, um, we have long days where we've got lots of light and plants can really grow yeah, well if absolutely. we give them the right conditions. Yeah, absolutely. This is a good example, this one, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. But, but the chefs are using the foliage, so you could be yeah. using that in the kitchen. But but as a, as a landscaper, I'd be using the accent, the, the variation between yeah, foliage absolutely. colours. I love grey plants in the garden. You know, at night time on a full moon, it's the grey plants that are your little beacons that they really shine parts of your garden. And they can... Add, they just add that accent um, mm. to it, um, so, to your so, garden. So just to, just to clarify, this this is the, the spot we call the salt bush commonly. Fragrant salt but bush. Fragrant salt bush, but yeah. it's grey edge is this particular yeah, variety. Yeah, okay. yeah. And it's one because there are a lot of different types of salt bush. There are. That you can actually get your hands on and, and grow right. at home. Yeah. This, this is um, a really... Uh, I thought more of an ornamental plant than mm -hmm. it was an edible, but I'm going to go and do some more research now that you've mentioned it. Okay, well, there we go. Yeah. All right, what else have you got? Let's go for something exotic okay. maybe. All right, so this one I've got it in a big pot, so I'll hold wow. it down here. Yeah, I'll hold that. Um, thank you. So this is the Radamachera summer scent, um, and some people say that this is kind of going to take over from the likes of Morea, which I don't know if it will take over no, from Morea. No, Morea's a great. Morea's just a wonderful plant. But it has a similar leaf to a Morea. Mm. Um, it's a little bit yellow in a pot. It's uh, like anything. It's like a child that you put out in the cold in winter without a jumper on. It, in a pot, it doesn't particularly <laughs> like it. Um, but in the ground, it's fine. It doesn't have that um, yellowing look. It's got a... Um, a a pretty little flower. It's cream with a yellow throat. It's a pinky cream with a yellow throat. 
and it um, it flowers in the summertime, obviously, and it's a lightly scented plant. Mm. This was introduced um, by um, Darwin plant wholesalers is from that a right? selection um, that was growing in India that he found and, and ah. bought in India and Sri Lanka, uh, where it's used extensively in quite tropical kind of conditions. But it does exceptionally well down here in the ah. cool climates too, doesn't it? Okay, it does. Mm. It does. In fact, and I was concerned that it wasn't a plant that was going to be particularly water wise or that it would withstand some of our conditions until a friend of mine and I, another horticulturalist, and we went to Calberry for a week. And as you do when you go on, on holidays with a horticulturalist, we walked the streets and looked at all the gardens. <laughs> and both of us stopped suddenly and went, look at that. And here was a summer scent out in the middle of this garden with the wind bashing at it. It was uh, probably 20 metres from the um, wow. from the, the salty uh, sea flower, breeze yeah. and it was just looking fantastic. These make great, um, I've just planted a hedge of them mm -hmm. um, in a friend's garden and um, they just, they look great. And they're, far, they're relatively fast growing. Yeah, and uh, I think in, in recent times it's become very popular as a hedging plant. It's Absolutely. It's become something that's um, very, very and water wise, it's definitely a water wise plant. Once it's established, you don't need to water it past those two or three days. And, and look, you know, it goes back to that thing that you talked about right in the beginning, and that is making sure that um, when you plant, if, as I said before, we talk about native plants, but it doesn't mean that it's native to WA or native that's to right. the Perth region. Yeah. It could be native to Queensland or it could be native yeah. to Tasmania, and, yeah. and they're all different. They need different things to make sure they're going to work. So, this Absolutely. is where getting your soil amendments right. Um, making sure that you know the soil is holding moisture so that it can get established quickly. Yeah. All these things get your advice from your local Waterwise Garden Centre. Absolutely, and and when you're thinking about um, planting, people think if they want a cottage garden, it's only about exotics, or if they want a native, it's only about natives. That's actually not quite true. You can plant the two together. You do have to be considerate of the fertilizer mm -hmm. if you're planting natives with exotics. But there's a lot of exotics that are not gross feeders mm. that do not need a lot of fertilizer, and maybe just a little bit of liquid fertilizer around their base. Is you know, to, to boost them on and then you just look at a, a good, um, you know, organic fertiliser from there on. Okay, well, we've got one more plant that we're going to talk about here. This... <laughs> well, this one's going home to my garden because I dropped it <laughs> oh, and I broke in. half of it. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'm quite pleased because I really do love um, Eremophilas. Did you realise 80% of the Eremophilas in Australia are from WA? So we've got this unique region just yeah. north of Perth that runs right up into the Midwest yes. where most of the Eremophilas originate from. Yeah. And some of the most beautiful plants I've ever seen come out of that sort region yeah including this one well this, this is Nivea, one, right? This is yes, Mo, but this is a new one from Nivea. It's a cross. Oh, okay. okay. So Nivea, yes, is from that same region. Yeah. But this one was found in a Victorian garden. Ah, so is this yeah. a natural hybrid? It's That's natural, right. Ah, yes. Fascinating. Yes. So it's called um, Beryl's Blue. Mm -hmm. um, flowers through winter and then on into flower spring. But in our climate, you can get spot flowers on Eremophilas almost all, almost all year round. Yeah. Um, it's got that, again, my favourite colour in the garden. It's got that lovely grey and it's soft. It's very this tactile very plant. very soft, isn't it? It's really soft. Yeah. It's a really pretty one. You do with your Eremophilas, generally, you need to tip prune them a fair bit. Mm -hmm. um, it, well, not a fair bit. You need to tip prune them. If you don't, they're going to get woody and uh, you'll end up with lots of wood at the bottom and all this beautiful at the top. Yeah, okay. Um, so I tend to... This one's been known it can hedge even. Right. Yeah. Wow. So, so so don't be scared to to prune. And and probably with natives, that's actually a, a good general rule is don't be scared to prune them because they no. tend to tend to be better plants and you they they have more vigour as a consequence of the pruning. That's right. It's good for them. Well, in our sterile garden setting, they don't get what they're used to mm -hmm. out in the bushland where they do get eaten by you know, by bugs yeah, and, so and wind and, and the fires that go through and so forth. So can I just ask you, mm. um, typically Eremophilus, particularly the, the Nivea species, I would be planting in a nice full sun, open, free draining yeah. position. Is that the Absolutely. Same they, they prefer um, a full sun and they also prefer a, um, a sandy soil. So if you're in a clay soil and you really want one, you might want to mound it up slightly mm -hmm. um, and certainly use something like some gypsum to keep the soil open. But otherwise, they love our sandy soil, which most of us have in Perth. Um, they are relatively frost tolerant, okay. moderately frost tolerant. Okay. So um, 
Interesting. Now, yeah. one of the things, one of the things I love about this particular plant, I do have some eremophilas in my garden, and I actually have some growing naturally. I don't know whether they've been introduced at some point, but in some bushland alongside us, but they're producing nice. a lot of flower in winter. And I've got mm. bees, and and there's a shortage of flower in winter yeah. for my bees, but I will find yeah. them in around the eremophilas all the time. Yes, and yeah. so it's a great food source for bees and yeah. for obviously birds that are looking for Look, nectar. it's it's something that I didn't mention with all of the others too. One of the things I wanted to do when I chose these plants was find plants that were water wise, obviously, uh, but also were great pollinators, mm -hmm. right? And the eremophila is one of them. But all of the plants that I've chosen today are great um, pollinators. Okay. And I think that's really important in our gardens too. Fabulous. All right. Now, yeah. can I ask you, I'm going, to, I'm going to take this one away and we won't be able to pull the next two in. There's no way, I don't think. But uh, no. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about trees. Have you got a couple of recommendations of really good trees? Yeah. Um, well, again, there's, look, there's hundreds of trees. We specialise in trees at the nursery and there's yeah. hundreds that I love. But there's a couple that are really easy to grow and a couple that are uh, they're quite different. So mm -hmm. that's why I've chosen them. Um, the first one, I guess, would be um, the Gladitzia sunburst. Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of the Gladitzias, especially the old, older ones, had a lot of thorns on them. Yes. So they were thornies, thorn, a lot of thorns on the branches. But with the sunburst, there's far less thorns. Yeah. It's quite an open um, tree. So although it provides you shade, it doesn't, you don't end up with that dank shade underneath that yep. then makes it very difficult to grow in underneath. Yep. Um, I've seen Gladitzias growing with shade, you know, um, with a garden bed only a metre and a half wide around them and the grass growing right up to them. Wow, so, fantastic. you know, um, well pruned. They grow to about eight by eight. Um, and they're not a weeping tree, but they have a very soft weeping habit about them. Mm -hmm. So the leaves are quite soft. And uh, so, I suppose simply by the name, sunburst, beautiful golden foliage. Yeah, yeah. So when the when the foliage first comes out, it's a limey green and the ends are, are golden and mm -hmm. then it goes more golden as the, the months go on. Wonderful. Um, and it goes a brilliant golden as it drops because, of course, it's a deciduous tree. Yeah. So you get your shade in the summer. And you get your sun in the winter, yeah, awesome. which is good. And awesome. again, it's a very water wise one. Well, the, simply, you know, by its nature of um, of being able to um, sort of, I suppose, produce that that new growth in the spring when there's lots of soil moisture, and then hold that through the summer, shading the ground below, and that lovely filtered light that comes through it. Yes, um, it, it's exceptionally good at, at, I suppose, reducing evaporation in a garden. Yeah, and so this yeah. is why trees are so important. Got another tree recommendation for us? Yeah. So the other one that we had um, is the Chinese pistachio, which I really love. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a tough tree. Um, I love the, it's got the long lanceolate leaves, so it's it looks a little bit different to a lot of the trees that you see. But one of the things I love about it is it's, you can plant this, not sure you want to plant it right on the coastline in, say, City Beach or something. Yeah. Um, you might want to put it at the back of your house where it doesn't get quite so yep, much of the wind. It. Yep. Uh, but it'll take the hot wind, right? So it'll take the, the hot easterlies. This, this um, is a nice shaped tree too. It's got a beautiful rounded shape yeah, too, hasn't it? It is. It mm. is. It's, again, it's about eight metres, six to eight metres. Mm -hmm. It won't go to eight metres in everybody's garden, but six to eight metres and about the same width, right? Mm. About six metres wide. So it's got a lovely shape, but it's the colour that I love. Yeah. The autumn colour is, if if you love a um, Chinese, pista um, Chinese, Chinese tallow, tallow You'll love a Chinese pistachio, mm, right? Yep. Um, and it's just that little bit different, but the colours are amazing. It's it's brilliant oranges and reds and a little bit of gold in there too. And Joe, you you probably few people know the the range of deciduous trees and how they perform, but you know often we'll see trees that are introduced. And if you're if you're within sort of a reasonable, say five to to ten k from the coast, some of those deciduous trees never colour up like they would on the label right. or like you'd see in a magazine. They just yeah. don't get it cold enough, or no. maybe the conditions are just not the right conditions. But in this particular instance, here's a, an ornamental deciduous tree that is just spectacular. And it'll give you that. Mm. You might get, like you might get in the hills, in the hills. a little bit more than I will yep. down on the flatland. Yep. 
uh, but you'll still get a good amount of yeah. colour, yeah. which I think is really precious. I love that. Me too. You Me know, too. it's like, hey, we're in autumn, you know. Well, it's those it's seasons. Great. It's making sure that we're, we're actually showcasing the seasons and that's one of those parts that you can yeah. bring in it and just, it's like it's on fire when they colour yeah. up, isn't it? It's isn't just it? magnificent. Yeah, it's stunning. It's a stunning tree. I could talk trees all day. <laughs> but we need to stop. All right. Well, how about how about we, um, we move to, we've got lots of questions coming through. And um, there's a couple of lovely comments. First of all, Kelly has said, hi, Joanne, love your gorgeous nursery in Guildford. Thank I have you. many fond memories. Good on you, Kelly. Well done. Rebecca, I love eremophilas. I think I think we all feel like yeah. that once we've, once we've realised yeah. what they are and we've got them in our gardens. We've got a few questions coming in. So Moira is in... Moya is Moya. in Waikiki. Sorry, Moya. Um, I've tried to plant pig face, but every time they get loads of mealy bug. How do mm. and I've had to try and get rid of it. Now, I've seen scale. It's yeah. not an unusual thing for it to get scale. I wonder whether that's what Moya is getting. I, I wonder if it is scale. I was going to say the same thing, Trevor, mm. because I think um, the uh, pig face are known to be relatively pest free. Mm. Um, but yes, in summer, you'll get a little bit of scale. Um, I guess if it's mealy bug, hmm. Well, you're just going to have to treat it with, with some oil, some pest oil or something. Yeah, so one of those horticultural oils is yeah. the way to go, isn't it? Yeah. So that's that's yeah. usually the solution. And look, the good and thing the about that is scale. if it is scale, you're, you're going to treat both of them. You're going to hit the both anyway. Yeah, so it's a good yeah, solution. Absolutely. Well, well done. You've won yeah. yourself a $25 gift voucher to spend at Guildford Garden Centre. Well done. Fantastic. Now, folks, if you've got a question for Joe, now's the time to ask. We've got them coming through. You're very kindly giving away three twenty-five dollar vouchers to spend at Guildford Garden Centre. That's fantastic. George is in Bustleton. Um, to stop phosphate getting into waterways, is there a suitable product that is slow release? There is, but I think it's also about not using, um, overusing fertilisers, and uh, using one that's uh, to me more of a, a mineral fertiliser, mm -hmm. where you get a better balance of phos yeah. phosphorus. Um, would you? Oh, I think so there? too. So yeah. So look, yeah. The, it's it's probably it's not just. I, I think there's a bit of a a thing about um, phosphorus. Phosphorus is a very important um, nutrient yeah. for plants. It's one yeah. of the three key elements. But um, l what used to happen, and why it's got such a bad name, is that farmers and I had a my grandfather was a dairy farmer, and every year mm. he would superphosphate the the paddocks. Yeah. And um, then what would happen is we'd get very wet during the winter and there'd be all this runoff into the creeks and they would run off into the rivers and then they would eventually run into the ocean so and we'd see happens. algal blooms. Yeah. And there's probably 60 or 70 years of, of probably bad farming practices that we're still dealing with the consequences of. I think as a general comment, most of the controlled release fertilisers these days have got the balance right and the important thing is that word controlled. Yeah, That's really, it's, it's changed everything because... Um, you know, I, I can always remember my dad, um, you know, come from the farm, he'd grab a, a 20 or 40 kilo bag of urea mm. and then our, our terrible sandy soils in Linwood where I grew up, um, he would go and put 40 kilos out on our 1,400 Ooh. square metre block. And it wasn't uncommon. And, and for, for two yeah. weeks we had the greenest lawn you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. And he'd Not be mowing like crazy, <laughs> and then then suddenly it'd go brown again and be like, yeah. oh, more. And this was a, yeah. this was a trap. But that, that's urea is nitrogen that's and right. nitrogen's equally as dangerous going into the soil. So I think the key, George, for me anyway, would be to make sure that you are looking at a true controlled release fertilizer, not a slow release because that's actually quite different. It's different. Mm. Yeah. So look for a controlled release. Now we'll might duck across the country here because we've Ooh, got, um, yeah, um, France. Well, Francis in Corumbara in Victoria just bought a beautiful Shizanthus. Are they easy to grow ah. at the moment? It's in a pot. Should I look at putting it in the ground? Well, yes, you can put that in the ground. In Victoria, uh, oh, it might be a little bit cold still if you're wanting to transplant. Maybe, mm. uh, but Shizanthus is a lovely little annual mm. that, yes, uh, you can put into the ground and it'll make a beautiful show in your garden. It's often called the poor man's orchid. Yes. I used to, used to love it. So it's got little orchid-like flowers yeah. and just gorgeous. But it depends where you want to put it, I suppose. The other thing you do have to watch out for is it is a bit of a softy shorter plant. So snails yeah. and slugs tend to love them as well. Yes, they do. And, and that's what I was thinking about. I'm not too sure about your weather at the moment, whether it's going up and down a bit like ours, but if you're still getting 
really cold days and hail like we've had recently, mm. you might want to hold off putting that into the ground. This um, this next question comes from the Sunshine Coast. and um, Nicole's asked the question, and I've been getting a lot of these questions asked from people locally here in Perth about mangoes. My mango's got new growth and heaps of flowers, but the older leaves have this spot on them. I'm wondering if I should do anything to make it more healthy. Yeah. What, what's the spot? Uh, well, I think it's fungal. Mm, me too. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, you look at it and you hope like heck it's not bacterial yep. because then you're the bad news fairy and you've got no so solution but to take it out yep. pretty much. But this, I think, is fungal. So I'd use um, perhaps a, a fungicide on that. Um, it tends to be with that kind of fungus that it's a copper-based one. So that's there's, right. Um, there's a particular type of copper um, that's active called cupric hydroxide. I think it's sold as coside. Oh, okay, and, yes, and it's, um, cosides a good one. It's a particularly effective treatment. I know that that's what um, commercial growers use uh, if they start to get any sort of fungal outbreak in their commercial mango tree crops. So it's probably not a bad solution there. So, Trevor, if they don't have coside in the garden centre mm -hmm. um, where Nicole's going to go, would that uh, be something like copper oxychloride? Copper would that oxychloride? be a similar? Yeah, that absolutely. would work too. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. Um, it's and and you know what? Even probably the the classic old Bordeaux mixture. Do you can oh. you still buy that? Uh, look, I haven't available? had it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not I'm not up to date with the la no. <laughs> latest of those. But look, <laughs> I suppose the key message here, Nicole, is a copper based um, fungicide will really probably do the job. And these days, um, Joe's probably far more up. Uh, on this than I am, but I've noticed that um, alternating uh, chemicals is is a very smart move because we tend to find that some of these yeah. pests have the ability to adapt after a while and it's not very effective. So it's like honey sandwiches every day are not good for you. It's the same thing. Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> so you know you want to you want to swap them around. Um, and I think if you're in Perth. Um, we're getting a lot of this sort of fungal thing come in at the moment. A lot of people are coming in with their um, uh, with their leaves and, and asking the question. And I think what we have to remember is we had, was it three dry days in July? Mm. So where we're saying to people it's overwatering and they're going, we don't overwater. Yeah. It was, everything was overwatered. Yeah. It's, um, it's been the most unusual winter. So uh, yeah. June was, was about 30 mils off average. Yeah. Uh, July was more than double the average in in the hills i had 478 mils of rain Whoa. that's almost half a meter in a month a it was bottle insane day. it's that's it's incredible amazing. so the ground even in the rocky spots where i didn't have a lot of topsoil was squishy it was just wow. soft and sodden yeah. and that incredible soaking is really really good yeah. but then we've had august and we've had below average rainfall again. Yes. So so now, you know, yeah. we, we will see the ground drying and how we deal with that is a really important thing. So yeah. making sure that you're watching with your, your mulch now. So uh, the yeah. other problem that we get asked all the time at the moment is um, weeds. I've got weeds coming up. And, of course, that soaking in July was a perfect platform as the weather got warmer for all that seed to germinate and in August. what amazing weeds oh. I've got. So if you've yeah. got that problem in your garden and you're just saying, look, I'm just yeah. sick of the weeds, get, some get, mulch get the mulch. Yeah. That's the solution. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good thing. That's a really, yeah. really good thing. Or pay thing. the grandchildren to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. good luck with that. I've got a, I've got a few teenagers that I can't convince to do that. Let so. alone the grandchildren. Yeah, I don't know. Just quickly going back to that, if you if you are concerned about anything fungal or anything spotted on your leaves, uh, just go into your garden, take some leaves, go leaves, into your yeah. garden centre, and get some good advice on mm. on what it is. That's what garden centres, what the yeah. traditional garden centre has always been so good at doing is yeah. helping you yeah. and talking through your specific situation. And Absolutely. that's an important thing is to understand the environment yeah. you're in. Once you once you've got you know an expert giving you a bit of advice, it'll solve you yeah. making all those small mistakes that we make as we yeah. learn about the environment. And you know, with technology these days, I know we have a website and we encourage people to send in photos. Yeah. So you can you can be in Victoria. You can send it in. We will answer you. Mm. It might take us twenty four hours to get back to you, but we'll give you the answer. <laughs> now, yeah. don't forget to hit the like button if you're watching on this beautiful sunny Sunday morning. Um, Joanne, uh, sorry, uh, Christine in Sterling. Hi, hi, Christine. She's a great supporter of ours. Um, went to your nursery about two years ago. Got a silver sword philodendron. It's going so well that I think it needs a trim and a repot. 
takes a lot. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah, it's great news. That's what happens when you get the right advice. That's what we want to hear. Absolutely. So she said that she'll be visiting again soon. Good on you, Christine. Look forward to seeing you, Christine. Now, Leah is in Serpentine. Leah is also a bit of a regular uh, on the show. She always gives us some um, good advice. Now, she's got a buffalo lawn. She wants to get clover out of the lawn. What's your recommendation? Well, there's a couple of different things. You can have a cup of tea in one hand Mm -hmm. and a fork in the other, Mm -hmm. which is going to take you forever. (laughs) Or you can get yourself um, some, um, there are some herbicides that will work on it. Um, You've got to make sure because it's a buffalo lawn, if you're going to use one of those hose on weed and feed kind of things, you get the right one. Because And if you're not sure what your lawn is, I always say just go for the buffalo one because it'll still do the same job as as the fine leaf lawn. That's right. Friday. That's right. But do ask and get the right one. Do explain which lawn you've got, whether Mm. you've got cooch or you've got a buffalo. Or we we refer to it as a fine leaf or a a broad leaf. Broad leaf. And that makes it easy for people and they don't have to fret about whether they know what they've got. That's brilliant advice. How good is this morning been fantastic it's been great <laughs> having you come in joe i really appreciate you doing that and sharing your amazing knowledge and advice if you were to leave us with three golden tips for this time of the year what would the most important things be just at this moment prepare your soil mm-hmm. get ready for summer you know it, it's still cool uh, but it's going to it will hit us and you've got to get your mulch on so get some mulch um, know what your soil is doing. Know if it's um, going to have that waxy uh, crust on it and get some uh, wetting agent. And just enjoy your garden. Mm. Just get out Now's there. Now's the time to do it. Plant as it? much as you want to. Enjoy what you've got. Get the right advice and enjoy your garden. Now, I know yeah. we've, we've been doing um, this predominantly for West Australians, but we know that we've had some people tuning in from other parts of the country as well. And at the moment, uh, there are so many people that are in lockdown. You know, a huge yeah. portion of the country is in some form of lockdown and you've been unable to get out and get around and and, and socialize in the neighborhood the way you may have done um, from from my point of view one of the best things you can do for your personal health yeah. uh, that will reduce stress levels and make you feel so good is go and spend a bit of time in your garden and it doesn't matter whether you're whether you're in that situation or whether you're just here and um, and you're feeling a bit stressed take your shoes off yes. walk out have a bit of a walk around, have a bit of a look, soak it up, smell the perfume, yeah. you know, enjoy this glorious day we've yeah. got here. And, get some um, make vitamin D, get your hands in the soil. It's good for you. Yeah, it's good it, for it the is soul. good for you and it's good for the soul. Now, we've got to say a big yeah. thank you to today's sponsor, the Water Corporation. They've made this show possible. And if you want to know anything more about water-wise gardening, and remember that's how we have to garden here in WA, that is the WA way, um, simply visit this website. It's thewatercorporation.com.au forward slash waterwise. They have some amazing resources of things to plant, the products you should be using on your garden. So we talked about wetting agents and irrigation today and all those things. There's a list of waterwise accredited products there. So make sure that you're looking for those when you head out into your garden centre. And of course, there's a great list of waterwise garden centres, just like Giants. Yeah, there's mm. lots of us out there. Now, um, mm-hmm. Michaela is going to send messages out to our prize winners after today's show. Thank you very much for your support. If you want any more information, you know you can always jump onto our website, catch up with previous stories from the Garden Gurus TV show. Um, easy thing to do, go to thegardengurus.tv or our YouTube channel, thegardengurus.tv. It's been actually um, very, very popular. Everybody's watching whole episodes and it's a really convenient way to watch when you want. Today's session is going to be turned into a podcast. It will pop up on Spotify or Apple Podcast or Audible. Um, oh, Audible. Po- po- podcasts are so My popular favorite. these days. And we recently uh, we were thrilled to get a literally get an email out of the blue to tell us we were the fifth most popular gardening podcast in the country. So thank you very much for your support. That's a really big thing because yeah. all this happens not because Joe and I are necessarily sitting here, but because we've got this great team of people around us who make it all happen. So big thanks to Michaela and Jimmy for getting up early this morning, coming in, setting up, all the pre-planning and organising. Of course, our friends at the Water Corporation doing exactly the same thing. Now, the good news is we are back tomorrow. So make sure you tune in. It's 10 a.m. Western Standard Time, 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time for those people who've tuned in from the East Coast. And I will answer all 
all your gardening questions, Joe. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Happy great. gardening, Thank everybody. You. Have a great day. Have a good day. This live stream is brought to you by the Water Corporation. Western Australia has its own unique climate, and with that comes its own set of challenges, particularly when it comes to creating a beautiful garden. Water Corporation has a wealth of resources to help master your garden, including a WaterWise plant directory, irrigation tips, and popular garden designs. To find out more, visit watercorporation.com.au forward slash waterwise.